Hey, thanks so much for coming to our YouTube channel. You're about to hear a message from one of our Sunday experiences, but before you watch it, do me a favor and click the subscribe button so you can catch all the new videos coming out each and every week. Enjoy today's message. Um, go to your Bibles. We're going to jump into the message today. We're in a series called Fake Photos. What does fake look like? That's what we've been talking about. What does fake look like? And we're going we're gonna, to, um, ooh wee, we're about to get into it. Are y'all ready? It's our custom here to stand for the reading of the Word of God. If you attend Hope Church, it's always good to do a few squats before you come. Work on those glutes and quads. Go, I didn't tell you where to go, did I? Well, if y'all were prophetic people, you would know. I'm just kidding. I'm just totally joking. It's just a joke, guys. Um, go to Mark chapter 11. I love to have fun in church. You, you should enjoy church, not endure church. If the people of God can't laugh, then what are we doing? Mark chapter 11. You ready? Go to verse uh, 12. We'll start there. We have it on the screen for you. It says, now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. He meaning Jesus. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. What did he find? For it was not the season for figs. In response... Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. My God. And his disciples heard it. Jump to verse 20. We pick up the story because after that part, Jesus goes into the temple and regulates. He just starts flipping tables over. He just starts doing all kinds of stuff, man. That's what I'm going to do at the next board game night with my family. Just flip over stuff. Verse 20. They're coming back by the same tree now. It says, now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the tree which you cursed has withered away. Verse 22, Jesus answered and said to him, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, not if. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. I'm going to preach a message today called Leaving Unbelieving. I'm leaving unbelieving. I believe unbelief is a place that people live in far too long. And today I believe through the power of the Holy Spirit and His Word that there's going to be some people leaving that place of unbelief around what you're believing for. Would you pray with me? Father, open our ears and our hearts. We want our faith to skyrocket to a new level today. God, we came in with one level of faith. I declare by your spirit, we're leaving with a new level of faith, a fresh faith. Open our ears and our hearts. Let us hear what you have to say. Move me out of the way, Holy Ghost. And Lord, thank you that you would even entrust me to preach your word. It's a privilege and an honor, and I do it with fear and trembling now. Speak to us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody just say, Lord, speak to me. You may be seated. You may be seated. The quality of your faith is dependent upon the quality of what you put it in. I'm going to say that again for the edification of the people. The quality of your faith is dependent upon the quality of what you put it in. Amen. That statement will mean more to you by the time we get to the end of this message. The quality of our faith is dependent upon the quality of what you put it in. When it comes to miracles that people experience from Jesus that I see in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
when I, I see these miracles, when it comes to these miracles these people received, uh, we see a majority of the time that Jesus never really did the same miracle or performed the same miracle with the same methods, right? Like he, he didn't always do the same thing twice. Like if there was a blind man, he didn't heal the same, the different blind men the same way. There was always something that he, there was different methods he used to accomplish it. There was one day Jesus was uh, walking to a man named Jairus' house who had a sick daughter that he was going to heal. And on the way, some of you know the story, there was a woman who the Bible calls the woman with the issue of blood. And she had this hemorrhaging that was going on for 12 years. And on the way to Jairus' house, this woman pressed through the crowd, which she was not supposed to do, because in those days, if you were sick, you could not come around community. You had to isolate yourself. And so, so she pressed through the crowd, though. She, she uh, uh, bypassed cultural context and, and went in. And the Bible says she grabbed just the hem of Jesus' garment. And the Bible says the moment she grabbed the hem of Jesus' garment, her bleeding stopped. Her, her miracle happened when she touched Jesus, right? She, she, she grabbed a hold of Jesus, and she was healed. But then the story continues, and of course Jesus turns around and talks to the woman and says, Woman, because of your faith, you have been he healed and made whole. The story don't end there because Jesus, who has this woman touched the hem of his garment, he continues on because he's going to Jairus' house, who has a little girl who is uh, sick and dead. In fact, on the way, friends from his home come and say, she's dead, don't bo bother the teacher any further. And Jesus tells the man, put your trust in God, have faith, all those things. And when he shows up to the house, he gets everybody out of the room. Watch this. He goes in and he grabs the little girl by the hand and picks her up. And she is raised from the dead. She's raised from the dead. In other instances, uh, he had a friend named Lazarus who was, who was sick. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, sent for Jesus. And Jesus did not go immediately. He stayed where he was a couple more days. And then when he finally showed up, Lazarus had already been dead for like three days. And so, so he goes to the tomb where Lazarus is at, tells him to open the, roll the stone away. And in that moment, Jesus simply speaks into the tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walks out. And, and, and they have to unwrap him from the grave clothes that he was in. There was another instance where a Roman centurion comes to Jesus. And he comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, my servant is at home sick and, 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 and it needs your healing. And Jesus is like, well, let's go. Come on, lead the way. And the man says, no, 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 you, listen to me. He says, I am a man under authority. I, I, he worked for the Roman government. He had soldiers under his authority. He said, I am a man under authority. And if I say to one, go, and he goes. I say to one, come, and he comes. I tell one to do this, and he does it. He's telling Jesus, I, I understand authority, and I've been watching you, and I see the authority on your life. And so you don't even need to move any closer to my house for this miracle to happen. All you need to do, Jesus, is just speak a word because I understand what authority looks like and Jesus I've seen you speaking and things are moving when you speak so I don't need you to come to my house and touch my servant all I need you to do is just speak that it's done and I know that it will be done and it's in that moment that Jesus turned to all his Jewish followers and said I have not found such a great of faith as this in all of Israel what am I trying to tell you in one moment in one instance the woman with the issue had to touch Jesus in another instance he had to go and touch a little girl. In another instance, he just spoke to Lazarus and Lazarus got up from the dead. In another instance, the Roman centurion just said, all I need you to do is say it's done and I'm going to believe it's done. I'm trying to tell you, every time that happened, Jesus would say, let it be done according to your faith. Let it be done according to your faith. And there's some people here today listening and watching online that you are like the woman. You have to reach out and you have to touch him because that's where your faith is at. There's other people. You need a touch from God. Your mind needs a touch. Your family needs a touch. Your relationships need a touch. Your finances need a touch. And you need Jesus to come touch your life again. Some of you are stagnant in your walk with him and you need him to touch you again. And then there's some of you, all you need is a word. 
That's where some of your fakes at. All you need is a word from God that you can take, hold on to, let it cultivate in you like the seed that it is, take it home, you water it, you grab a hold of it, and all you need is say, God, hey, all I need is a word and I'm good. I, I, I don't have to reach out and touch. I don't need you to come touch me. Just speak and I can grab a hold of my fake that way. See, because we have different different kind of uh, degrees of faith, but the common denominator that all these people was, that even though their faith was different in degrees, the common denominator was the same, and it was where they put their faith, and it was in Jesus, because the quality of your faith is dependent upon the quality of what you put it in. And, 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 and these people received their mountains. And I asked the question, why would Jesus not do a miracle the same way twice? Why did he heal a blind man one time by spitting on him? Right? In fact, I want to do a live illustration right now. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. He spit on this dude and, and, and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Another, a man named Blind Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside of Jericho and he just spoke and, and had his eyes open. Same condition, different method. And I started to think about, God, why didn't you do this thing the same way? Why didn't you just do, why didn't you have a method for every miracle and you just went to that every single time? And it's not because he, he didn't want to go to the same method. He was doing it for the benefit of our faith. Because our faith has to be dependent on him. Because the quality of your faith it's dependent upon the quality of what you put it in. Amen. You're going to catch me in a second. And so, and so he did not heal two blind men the same way. And I asked God, why is that? Why not just do it the same way? Because, and then I felt the Holy Spirit just nudge me. And he said, because formulas don't move mountains. Faith does. Amen. And in our day and age, we want formulas get rich quick schemes, if I could use that term. We want to do things quick. We want to have it done. And I believe the Lord knew in his sovereignty, if he did it the same way, then whole denominations would form a faith around a formula of how he did it in scripture instead of depending on him from faith to faith, from glory to glory. And so he makes you depend on him for every season and every situation. And so we can't get disheartened because he didn't do it for me the way he did it for somebody else that had the same situation. If somebody had the same situation as you and he did it for them quickly, then that was their portion. But if he takes you on a little bit of a longer journey, don't be discouraged. There's a reason he didn't do it instantly and there's a reason he's doing it incrementally. It's because he don't want us trying to formulate and figure out formulas to try to equate how it can be done. Because in, we, want, we want to try to equate impossible things into a little equation and a formula that makes sense to our mind. But we serve a God who don't make sense to our mind. He is eternal. We can't even fathom with our finite brains just how big and infinite God really is. And me by saying how big he really is is stupid already because infinite goes on forever. So, so we can't put a formula. He said, he, he didn't, his word doesn't say without a formula, you can't please God. He said without faith, you can't please God. I'm trying to see who's been listening these last several weeks. I'm trying to see who's been listening. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Not a formula because formulas don't move mountains. Amen. Faith moves mountains. And every time he would say, let it be according to your faith. According to your faith. It's not on whether he can do it or not. We know he can do it. We know he can do the impossible. But it's whether or not we actually believe he could do the impossible. And am I truly putting my faith in him? Am I, am I really putting my faith in him? Hmm. And we see this scripture in Mark chapter 13, or Mark 11, excuse me, Mark 11, 13. Jesus gives us a lesson in how this works. He gives a lesson. In fact, in my Bible, the, the title of the parable at the top says, The Lesson of the Withered Fig Tree. He's, a, he's giving a lesson. He, he doesn't do this because he's necessarily, yes, the scripture says he's hungry, but there's more to it than just being hungry for him. He's, he's always teaching. He's always trying to show his disciples something because he's going to entrust them with this thing called the church. 
And so he, 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 he's teaching a lesson, and he gives a lesson on faith in Mark chapter 11. And the Bible says he was hungry, and he saw a fig tree that had leaves on it. He saw a fig tree that had leaves on it, uh, and he found when he walked up to it, he didn't find anything but leaves. And the scripture says it wasn't the season for figs. Now, I got a bunch of questions here. When you read the Bible, you should ask why and start to dig in a little further. You'll go down this amazing rabbit hole that takes you into fresh revelation. I'm telling you, it's amazing. The Bible is not boring. You're boring. That's what the problem is. <laughs> Watch this. So Jesus approaches this tree because there's leaves on it. And he says, well, there's leaves on it. There must be fruit on it. And he approaches this, th this tree, and when he gets there, the Bible says when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. And, and, and then at that point, because there was no fruit, no figs, he then says, the Bible says, in response, in response to it just having leaves and no figs, he says, no one's ever going to eat fruit from you again. And he goes on his way, and we know it withered away. Now, that can seem harsh, like, man... Jesus, are you an environmentalist? Like, what are you, what's going on here? You, you don't care about trees? To which he would probably respond, I made the trees. I can do what I want with them. Right? Hey, he's the owner. And when you're an owner, you can do whatever you want with it. And so he is the owner. He created these things. So he speaks to the tree, and it withers away. And we think, we, we think Jesus is being harsh by, by destroying the tree, but he's actually teaching a lesson. Hmm. My qu first question is, what was the reason he even approached the tree in the first place? Why did he approach the tree? Why? He saw leaves on it. He didn't see fruit. He saw leaves. And an indication, specifically in those days for sure, that if a tree had leaves on it that was known for bearing fruit, then if it had leaves, then it had fruit. Amen. And so the reason he approached it was because he saw what looked like something that had the potential to produce fruit. And when he gets up to the tree, he looks around and does some fruit inspection. And he doesn't find any fruit. He doesn't find any figs. He only finds leaves. Because this fig tree had leaves, which was an indication to someone looking at it that there would be fruit. And since it looked like a tree that could produce fruit, the expectation was there would be fruit. Somehow I don't feel like Jesus is just talking about a fig tree now. Hmm. And then, to defend the tree, it says it wasn't even the season for figs. So if Jesus is God, my next question is, bro, you knew. This thing wasn't going to have any fruit on it because only you know the times and seasons. You created seasons. You, Jesus, you. You're the word. You created it. That's you. In the very beginning, remember? Winter, spring, summer, fall. Remember those? It's not even the season for this fruit to be producing. But somehow I get the feeling that the reason... This thing withers is not because it's the wrong season. That's not the reason at all. It gives the detail, but the reason this tree withers on behalf of Jesus speaking to it was not because it was the wrong season. The reason Jesus causes this tree to wither is because the tree is advertising that it has something that it is not really producing. Amen. Did you hear me? I said, this tree is advertising with this outward appearance that it looks like something that has the ability and should have the ability and should be able to produce fruit. But when Jesus gets up to it, he sees this was only an outward show. This was only an outward advertisement that the inward did not have the ability to produce what I was expecting from it. And could it be that Jesus gets frustrated with things that promote an outward appearance that does not have the inward ability to produce the fruit that it says it can produce? Now he's talking to us about faith, that if you're going to say you're a follower of Jesus, and you're going to say I'm a Christian, and you're going to say I'm going to church to get a word, and you're going to listen to your Christian music on the radio, and you're going to do all of that, then what Jesus expects then is fruit 
from your life. He is not satisfied with outward appearances. You can look clean on the in- outside, but be full of dead men's bones on the inside. He told the Pharisees one time, you are like some whitewashed sepulchers. That means you look like a good gravestone. You look good on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. And God has no tolerance for things that have leaves, but no fruit. And he says, if you're going to follow me, then you're going to have to leave unbelief and you need to step into bearing the fruit I put in you to bear, but that requires faith. These people draw near to me with their mouths outward, but their hearts are far from me, inward. Jesus always dealt with the inward as the priority. That tells me the opposite can be true as well. My life can look a mess, but God still get fruit out of it. But we don't like that because we are concerned with keeping up our levy appearances. I got to look like I got it together. I got to look like I can do it. And you have all these leaves. Jesus is concerned, where's your fruit? That's what I came for. I came to see if you have any fruit since you out here advertising that you are a fig tree. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is so, he's so tactical with what he does. And he says, you're not going, no one's ever going to eat fruit from you ever again because you showed me a false advertisement you told me that you had this ability in you but yet you are not producing through that potential and ability now, there's a lot of people who follow Jesus but the following stops when obedience starts Amen. I know that's not great to hear for you because some of you are like, okay. But can I tell you, this faith journey is not something that's for the faint of heart. Like, if you want to look good and look like a tree, then God is required. His expectation is fruit should come from you. And the element that brings that fruit out will be your faith. Hmm. The Lord says, I do not care what season that it is. I have no tolerance for people who look like a Christian outwardly, but are producing nothing with the faith they say they have. Hmm. Yeah. Let me, let me go deeper. You want me to go deeper? Yeah. See, this is the difference. Watch this. Listen. This is the difference in believing in God and believing God. Let me take my time through here. It's the difference now of believing in God, his existence, and then believing God. Got it? You can believe in God. But I've learned just because I believe in God doesn't necessarily mean I believe God. Hmm. Because to believe God requires trust. And it requires trust in someone you can't see. The great Billy Graham said, you believe in the wind, don't you? You can't see the wind, but you see the effects of the wind. Amen. And you have to trust in a God you can't physically see. You're okay with believing that he exists. But when it comes down to believing in what he can do, that's a whole other level of trust. It's the difference. Let me, let me, let me help you. because I, I got, Let me give you some receipts. In James 2, 19. Watch this. This, this is crazy. This is crazy. The elbow your neighbor and say, this is crazy. This scripture says, you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe. 
Excuse me? Let me rewind that back. It says, you believe, am I reading it right? Okay. You believe that there is one God. Great. Good for you. Then he smacks us in the face. Even the demons believe in, in God's existence. And they tremble. So it tells me the believing in God part isn't enough. Believing in God is the starting line. It's not where I stay. It, 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 it's not where I stay. I, I believe in God. But do you believe God? And it's easy to say that when you have no problems. When you have no doctor's report staring you in the face. When you have no financial trouble. When your kids are running around causing all hell on earth to come. When, when you don't have enough. When, 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 you, when you can't get it together. When things are going every which way but straight. Do you believe God then? I know you believe in God. But do you believe God? And it says, that's good that you believe in God. The demons even believe that. Oh my God. So if I stay at the believe in God level, then I have the same level of faith that a demon has. I wonder how many people are living life with faith like a demon. It's quiet in this Catholic church. <laughs> what differs you from a demon? I thought about calling this message demon fakes. Because sadly, that's where a lot of people stay at. Their life never reflects that they actually believe God. Amen. They're satisfied with simply believing in His existence. And that's good enough. I'm good enough to believe in Him. But what, what it requires from me to believe Him is just too much I'm willing to sacrifice. I wonder how many professing Christians around middle Georgia, around the United States, have the same level of faith as demons do. This is a good time to ask your neighbor, what makes you different from a demon? Now, if they start like rolling their neck around and like doing all that, like, Call security. Security? No. We're going to lay hands on you in the name of Jesus in the UFC way. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> but, but seriously, guys, like, how many of us have been living with what we think is fake, but it's the same level of faith as a demon? And I'm satisfied to believe in God, that he created the universe. That's cool. That's the starting line. He's got more for you that's going to require you to believe him. What differs you from a demon? And God gives us this gift called faith. To live out, to work, to water, to plant, to, to grow, and to, to cultivate so that our lives actually are separated from the culture and society of the world that actually makes us stand out from the darkness of the world and actually we become a city on a hill. We become, we become a light in the dark. We become salt to the earth. That's, we become what he said we should become, but it requires not just believing in God, it requires believing God. And I don't want to live my life with faith on the same level as a demon. What if you get to heaven? He said, you believed in me, but your faith never made it past Lucifer. Like, I had so much in store for you in your life that if you would have just trusted my ability, you could have experienced. But because you did not trust in me, you only believed in me, but you didn't trust me, I let you keep what you were satisfied with. 
Because I've learned God will allow you to live on the level you are satisfied with. I don't want to live on demon level. It ain't demon time, I'll tell you that. I'm trying to see what God has for me. Because if the scripture is going to tell me in Ephesians 3 and 20, he can do exceedingly, abundantly. Come on, you know it. Above all, it's the one we say to get excited. But it's going to take a long journey of faith to experience the above all. Amen. And the exceedingly he has. It takes a bold level of faith. One that doesn't just have leaves. It has fruit. I don't want to have faith like a demon. Don't that sound like theologically crazy? Faith like a demon? What? No, no, no. I want faith that God uses for his glory. I want faith that can produce fruit. I don't want, I don't want to be in the crowd that's satisfied with the level I'm on. I'm, I'm content. The Apostle Paul said, I've learned the secret of contentment. I know how to be content, whether I'm hungry or fed, whether I have clothing or naked, whether I'm rich or poor, I have, I'm content. So it's one thing to be content with where you're at, to be content with what God is doing, but not satisfied. I'm content with what God's doing, but I'm not satisfied because I know there's more. Does that make sense to you? Jesus is so intentional. When he said this, Patrick, he said to the, he said to the tree, he said to the tree, no one's going to eat fruit from you ever again. Because you advertise something you're not producing. And what he expects is if you're going to have leaves, you better have fruit. That's my expectation for this tree. And it's my expectation for God's people. And the Bible says that when he said that, the disciples heard it. Isn't that what it says? It says, Jesus, it says he said it and the disciples heard it. Do you understand Jesus is intentional about everything he does? He never does anything accidental. Even the place you live at right now is not accidental. The job you are working is not accidental. The job you just lost is not accidental. There is, a, there is a purpose at work for what God is doing in your life. In fact, he allowed these disciples to hear this, and he wanted them to hear it because he knew they would need this lesson in the life they were to live ahead. Because hmm. Jesus allows us, and the Lord allows us to hear certain things. Hmm. The Lord allows us to hear certain things. It was true for the disciples because he needed them to hear the tree was going to wither and then for them to see it the next day because he was connecting a bridge between what they heard and what they saw. And so he allows you to hear certain things. He, he allows you to hear certain things when you hear them because he knows what will cause your faith to grow and go to a new level. So he allows you to hear certain things. He lets you hear the things that will challenge the current place of faith you reside in. He lets you hear not just the good stuff. He lets you hear the bad stuff, the hard stuff, the impossible stuff. Why? Because after you've heard the doctor's report, after you've heard you don't have what it takes, after you've heard there's not enough, and after you've heard all of that, it forces you to decide where your faith will be put, and it makes you choose whether you just believe in God or you actually believe God. It forces you to choose. So when you hear, it's not looking good. When you hear, you don't have enough. When you hear, you are not able. When you hear, you're going to be just like your daddy. When you hear, your family will never rise above poverty level. When you hear, this thing is never going to turn around. You might as well just settle in because this is how your life's going to be the rest of your life. When you hear it, you come to a fork in the road that makes you accept it or makes you say, no, nope, my faith is in the quality of God's word, the quality of his truth. I am dependent upon him and I know what reality says because faith does not deny reality it doesn't gloss over reality it stares reality in the face but chooses to put itself in the hands of God and it leaves unbelief and steps into a new level of belief I know I'm preaching to some people right now who need a new level of belief because what you're hearing is contrary to what God said I just want to encourage you keep stepping keep walking by faith don't put it in man's hands put it in the one who can do something about it and after you've done all you know to do then stay Come on, elbow your neighbor and say, stand. It forces you to believe God, not just believe in God. Because I hear the scriptures, I hear the songs, I, 
I, I, I see all the stuff, and, but where's your belief? Where's your belief? Where's it at? Are you just that saving fake? You believe to get saved and that was good enough for you? Or maybe some of us are in surrogate faith. You're living off someone else's faith. That's okay, okay, cool, but at some point, God wants you to have your own. Because I am the result of the faith of my mother and father who prayed me away from harm, prayed me from my stupidity. Pray me. I am the result of prayers from years ago of someone else's faith. So surrogate faith is not in itself bad. It's just at some point you cannot reside or live off someone else's faith. You're going to have to step out on your own at some point and begin to believe because God wants you to trust in him and not what someone else trusted in. And their level of faith. Am I making sense? And so, so they leave the fig tree. He goes and regulates in the temple, flipping over tables does this thing and they come back by they come back by and Peter's like hey Jesus and I'm going to paraphrase it what you said would happen actually happened I can see Jesus' face like and you're surprised like and, he's, and, and Jesus responds he doesn't give like the molecular structure of how the tree shriveled and he doesn't go through the process. He doesn't tell him here's how it happened. Uh, he just says something very simply in verse 22 after Peter's observation. And he says in verse 22, have faith in God. I know it's mind blowing, right? Like yeah, that, that makes sense. Makes sense. Heard that in Sunday school. Have faith in in God. Now, now you just told me, Pastor Jordan, that I can't just believe in God. I got to believe God. Right? Amen. So now Jesus is saying have faith in God. What's the difference between believing in God and having faith in God? Because the two are not the same. Believing in God is one thing. Having faith in God is another. Believing in God, as I said, communicates you believe his existence. Having faith in God communicates you trust his ability. I'll say it again. Believing in God communicates his existence. Having faith in God trust his ability. Because I don't have the ability to heal cancer. I, I don't have the, the ability to do that. So what do I do? When I'm in a, in a situation where something is needing to be done that I don't have the ability for. I do all I know to do, but then when I hit the end of what I know to do, somewhere my faith has to be put. And I can choose to put it in what the doctor's ability is. Or I can say to God, Lord, only you can dry up those cancer cells right now. Only you can do that. And I started thinking about Joshua who said, do it for your name sake. Do it for your name. Do it for your name. Because anytime he will do a miracle, it's not just so you can get what you need, it's so that other people can see the evidence of God's presence working. Do it for your name. Joshua was a man who was so bold in faith, he literally had faith that God could stop the sun from moving. Did you know that? Go back and read in the book of Joshua. It's titled, Sun Stand Still. They're in the middle of a battle, and Joshua has the craziest thought. And he sees the sun start to go down. And he says, hold up. We ain't done slaughtering this. I ain't done working. There's a victory at hand, and God, I need you to make the sun stand still. He didn't think about the consequences of the solar system that would occur and the fact of the sun not going down. You know there's consequences when the sun doesn't stay on schedule. If I knew those consequences, I would tell you. 
I just know it's not good for the ecosystem. It throws off the pattern. My point is, God interrupted a regularly scheduled pattern because one man in the midst of a battle had the boldness and courage to say, God, I can't make the sun stand still, but you can, and you see what I'm battling here. And so I can't put my trust in us getting it done quicker, but I can put my trust in you making something slow down a little bit so I can accomplish, Amen. so I can do this thing. So I can, it's because we serve a God who is able to move in time in ways we cannot. He can redeem time. That doesn't mean he takes you back to the future like Michael J. Fox. It just means he is able to redeem things in an amount of time that would have taken longer if it was up to me. I'm about to give myself an offering on that because I can't even say that again. I can't even say it again. I hope you wrote it down. This man was bold enough to ask the sun to stop moving. Do you understand that? And please, I don't mean this harshly, and here some of us are praying just to make it week to week. I don't mean that harshly. I'm just trying to encourage your faith to say, what am I really believing for here? I serve the God who holds the stars in the palms of his hands. And he knows every one of them by name. And all I'm going to ask for is to make sure my check don't bounce. And see, some of us stay there because we don't even trust God with our tithe. Amen. And so our dependency is on what we can do with the money. But when I release my tithes to God and my offering, I'm saying, God, I'm going to trust that you're going to give me enough. I know we got groceries. I know we got electric bills to pay. I know we got to put gas in the car. I know all of that. But, but my, I'm communicating trust in you that you're going to take care of my needs but you need the first from my life, and I'm going to give you my first. Don't tell me you believe in God, but don't believe him. We got people in the Bible asking for the sun to stop moving. The sun that's 93 million miles away. Or so they've told me. That if it was any closer to us, we would burn to death. If it was further away, we would freeze. And this man stood in the middle of a battlefield in the Middle East way back many thousand years ago and had the audacity to say to God, that thing that's 93 million miles away, can you make it stop? It doesn't matter the distance between you and what you're believing for. Because God is a God who knows how to close the gap. Jesus, the tree has withered up. Have faith in God. So it's not the same as believing God. Believing God is existence. I know God exists. Having faith in God believes in his ability. That's totally different. How many of us are simply believing in God for something we don't have faith in God for? I believe in existence, but I'm not trusting him with it. I'm not, I'm not doing I'm not trusting his ability to do it. Can you, I'll go get my table. Can you get my table real quick? I want to show y'all something. Because I was praying, Lord, help me to explain this, because this is such a thing I want people to go home with and just really get. You know, every Sunday's that way, but I just want you to walk away with some type of visual picture where you're like, I get it. Because this message needs to matter to you when the circumstances of life come against you and you, can, you have something to fall back on. Does that make sense? And so, so I, I, I was trying to think of the best way, and I believe that we, that we got it. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Just put it down there. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Everybody good? Yeah. It's, it's 1122. We're doing good. <laughs> All right. We're going to say this is your faith. I see that. See that? And I thought about how this, this really is how some of our faith is. Because we have faith as long as we're up. 
But as long as we're up, we're good and we believe, but then we come back down. Okay. Um, so I started thinking about what I'm putting my faith in. Right? And I got a few examples, but there was one, the first one, that, because Jesus said what? Have faith in who? Y'all sleepy over here. Have faith in who? Have faith in God. Okay. And so, this represents my faith. And this represents my faith, not in God, but it represents my faith in me. Where some of you are at, I have faith in me. My ability, my knowledge, my confidence, that's where I've put my faith. And I'm wondering why my mountain ain't moving. And when I have faith in me, and I put my faith in me, and not in God, I trust my confidence. I trust my knowledge. And I trust my ability. But then, all of a sudden, the problem with that, everybody say there's a problem. The problem with that is whenever my ability runs out, when my confidence runs out, when my knowledge runs out, I'm crushed by it. So the thing I've put my faith in, which is me, does not have the ability to keep me when pressure hits my life. So when pressure hits, I, am not, I can't sustain me. And so when pressure hits, I'm crushed by it. Let's try a different cup this time. Let's put our faith in something else. Let's put our faith in something else. This is my faith in people. So now I'm, where I tried putting my faith in my knowledge, confidence, ability, I'm going to try what people can do for me. I'm going to put my faith in their resources, I'm going to put my faith in their ability, their knowledge, and I'm going to put all my faith in them. The problem with that is when their ability, their knowledge and confidence, their resources runs out, you're back at the dumps again because your faith wasn't put in God. It was put in something that didn't have the ability to keep you. Because can I tell you this? People will fail you. I will fail you. I thought you was a pastor. You was a man of God. Yeah, I'm a human being. I'm not some kind of Christ bot. That got programmed on planet 32 somewhere and got sent here. I am a human being with feelings and emotions and all these things. I am complicated. Because when I do something that... that doesn't give you the knowledge, that doesn't give you the confidence, that doesn't give you the resources, and you put your faith in those people, and pressure comes, and those people can't keep you, still a little crushed. It can't keep you. a different cup. This might be the one. I'm going to put my faith in my circumstances. As long as my life is good, I'm going to give God the best praise. Pastor, you ain't got to worry about me. I'm here for whatever you need me to do. God is good.
And see, we're programmed. And some of us are cool with programming instead of transformation. I know what to say. I know what to say back. It sounds good. And it is right. It's not false. God is good all the time. But what happens when your tradition lets you down? Huh. What happens when circumstances of life take a twist that seems to have come out of nowhere? And you get an unexpected phone call that punches you in the gut like Mike Tyson hits you. Unexpected, out of nowhere, didn't expect it. Life was going just fine for you. You was moving and grooving, you was doing your thing. And then all of a sudden circumstances hit that were different from the ones you put your faith in. And now the circumstances you put your faith in are being tested and pressure is hitting it. Let's see if I can. And what happens? It gets crushed. You ready? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it real hard. Here we go. Ah, there we go. Crushed it a little bit. There we go. And the circumstances are going to change. In fact, can I give you a scripture? Let me give you a scripture. James chapter 1. Let me read it to you. James chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. You ready? It says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Amen. You know what happened? The wind and the waves started to come of life, and that's your, your, your faith was put in calm seas. Your faith was put in the condition that the sea would stay the same. But when those conditions changed, so did your faith. He says, James says, if you ask but doubt, you shouldn't expect anything from God. You're like a double-minded man being tossed because you put your faith in something that could not sustain you. Sorry, I just had a flashback to my college days. Uh, <laughs> thank God for grace. Hallelujah. <laughs> Some of y'all ain't laughing. You were right. Don't even get me started. <laughs> All right, so I put in faith in me. Put my faith in people. Put my faith in circumstances. Um, so I'm going to put my faith now in my resources. Put my faith in my resources. What I have. I got some, I'm, I'm pretty, I got some good stuff. Right? I got, I'm good. I'll put my faith in my money in my bank account. That'll keep me. Bank account's looking good. I even got some retirement set back. As long as I have my stuff. As long as I have my stuff that gives me status and it makes me look like I'm somebody to other people. Because you have to keep appearances up, right? Like, as long as I got resources, as long as I got stuff, as long as I look like I got it together, I'm good. I'll, I'm satisfied with being a tree with just leaves. Hmm. Problem with that is that all of those things are fleeting. And the resources you put your faith in were simply meant to be tools God gave you to build with. Amen. That's what those resources were given to you for. Your skill set, your ability, the gifting he put in you was meant to be used to build something. Even the level of finances you're at are supposed to be used to build something. Even the knowledge you have, you should be developing and growing. All that's meant to build something. But when we use those resources just to put up and keep 
up appearances. We put our faith in what our resources can do. But what happens when the resources run out? Was my trust in resources all along? Or was it in God? Where was my resources? Because I tell you, sometimes the well does run dry in our houses. Sometimes we have to figure some things out. Sometimes the economy goes south. And if our heart is attached to the economy, and that's where our trust is, we will be people who freak out. We will lose our minds when the pressures of lack of resources start to mount. And there's some people here, you're waiting to do the thing when the resources show up. And God, can I tell you, God does not work that way. God works with what you already have in your hands. And as you trust him with what you have, he will multiply it and grow it. I'm so thankful the little boy at the hill that day when 5,000 people were sitting around knew what he had could not feed all of those people, right? He didn't have enough turkey and jiffy, right? He didn't have enough, but Jesus took it. And where did he put what he had? Come on, read your Bible. Where did he put what he had? Where did he put his business? In God. Where did he put his children? In God. Where did he put his household? Where did he put his finances? Where did he put? He put it in God. And God did something exceedingly abundantly than what that little boy could ever do with what he had in his hands. Because he chose to work with what he had instead of sitting back and saying, I don't have enough resources. If we did that here at Hope Church, none of this stuff would be occurring right now. None of it. But because people understand, and you understand as a giver, as someone who's generous, that it takes resources to do the work of ministry. And it takes all of us putting our trust not in my resources, but in the fact that when I put my resources in God's hands, He has the ability to do more with it than my hands ever could. So I'm going to steward what I have to the best of my ability and my faithfulness, trusting in God with it, because I know the pressures of life will come. I know medical business will come. I know car issues will come. I know situations are going to arise that begin to try to eat away and deplete what God's given me. And if I put my faith in my resources when that happens, I meant to do that. It gets crushed. Hey, me that, Jay. Can you hear me that? And a little ping pong ball. There we go. Thank you, sir. I want him to see all the cups. Just want to see. Just want to see. See that? Do you see that? All these things got crushed because they were not able to sustain what was put in it. Why? Because the quality of your faith will be dependent upon the quality of what you put it in. I got one more. Okay. <laughs> we got to address the first problem. My hands are sweaty. I can't open the lid. Let's address the first problem. This cannot be planted and give you something back more than what it went in as. <laughs> and really, this little ping pong ball, it's got holes all in it. It's got these holes in it, like some of our faith. Got holes in it. Leaks. Not trusting God. And the thing that I came to the conclusion on with this, if we went outside and we went and buried this in the dirt, we can come back a year from now and guess what? Dig up that same spot, you can get a dirty ping pong ball. Watch this. You know why? Because it's not even the right substance. Because faith is the of things hoped for. 
Well, I could go out there and bury this, but guess what? I would not be burying faith in the ground. I would be simply putting optimism to work. And some of us are living life thinking we're living by faith when really it's optimism. And optimism and faith are not the same thing. Optimism hopes for a good outcome, and you see things with a positive manner. We need that. We need optimism, don't we? But don't expect optimism to move a mountain. Because you got the wrong substance. Optimism does not move mountains in the same way formulas don't move mountains. So the problem is we already started off with the wrong substance. I didn't put my faith not only in the right place, I didn't have the right substance. I just hoped it went well. I hoped it went well with no action backing up what I said I believe could happen. Does that make sense to you? Amen. So what do we do? That's the first problem. Well, Jesus says something I, I love. He said, uh, I believe it's what, Matthew 17? Is that where I gave you guys? Matthew 17? You guys got it? He was in the Gospel of Matthew. And he, and he came down from a mountain one day after he transfigured before three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. And he came down the mountain, and the other nine disciples were trying to cast a demon out of a little boy. A little boy, he threw himself in the fire, threw himself in the water. Right? And they couldn't cast him out. The father was like, I brought him to your people. I took him to the church, and he still came home the same way. I brought him to home church. He sang all the songs. Had some people hug him. It felt good. But he wasn't changed. He wasn't transformed. And Jesus said, oh, perverse generation, how long must I be with you? And when that word perverse there doesn't mean the way we typically think about it in something sexual or something like that. He was saying perverse meaning meaning. Your mind is on flesh things. It's bent. It's iniquitous. And he cast the devil out of the boy, and the disciples come after that situation, and James, they asked Jesus, hey, why couldn't we cast him out? And his response was this. He said, because of your unbelief. And then he says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be moved, and it will move. And while some of us have a faith like a ping pong ball, Jesus says, you got to get the right substance in you first. Y'all can't even see these. And Jesus gives the depiction and the illustration of something that is probably the smallest thing that you can hold in your hand. Y'all see that? You can't see. He uses the thing that even if I hold in my hand, you can't see it in my hand, but it's there. And he uses that up against the biggest thing our eyes can see, the mountain. Because the mountain looks insurmountable. The, the problem looks like it's immovable, like it, it will be something that will always be there. And he's using this as a picture to d illustrate that if you just have a substance of faith the size of the smallest thing on the planet, you can look to the biggest thing that is in front of you. And because you have faith, not the size of a ping pong ball, not the size of a bowling ball, not the size of a basketball, but the size of a mustard seed. If you just have that kind of faith, you can say to this mountain, be moved. Well, wait, I just, hold on now, God. Here, y'all have some seats. Wait a minute. It'll move? Yeah. Why? Because of where you put it. It's where you put it. So you've tried you. You tried other people, right? You tried circumstances. You tried all the resources. None of that worked out. How about you try it my way? Try this. Where do I need to put it? Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Have faith. 
in God. Covered. Covered. Now, pressure comes to life. Adverse circumstances that you didn't plan on dealing with start coming. People turn on you that you were depending on. Your resources run out. You thought you were going to have that retirement, but something went haywire, and now you had to use that retirement to take care. Wait a minute. How, this, the, my kids aren't saved. They're living. They're strung out on drugs. They're going out partying. They're sleeping around. I don't know what's going to happen. I, just, I don't see it happening. I, life is trying to, and the enemy is trying to crush it. Maybe we kick it around a little bit. Maybe we throw it. Maybe it gets, gets pushed around. Maybe if, maybe if things show up that you aren't counting on. Maybe if pain shows up, hurt shows up, the doctor's report shows up. And maybe all that stuff starts to happen. And, and all of a sudden, you see people around you who've been crushed by the same thing you're going through. You're trying to figure out, how am I still standing when somebody who dealt with the same situation has been crushed? by the thing. It's because of where you decided to put your faith and life will come and the enemy will come to test it, to kick it around and he will knock on the door of your heart to try to get you bitter. Here, to knock, knock on that, knock on that. Just knock on it real quick. It, get, it ain't gonna be crushed. There's nothing that can touch the seed that has been put in this thing right here. Do you understand why it's not being crushed? Because it's durable. It's something that is at, comes as advertised. It's not false advertising. So when I put my faith as small as a mustard seed in the one who is unshakable, who doesn't shift, who doesn't change, he remains the same. He is a firm foundation. I don't know when the time is going to happen for you, but until then, my faith will remain in the one that can do something about it. I tried my way. I tried other people's way. I tried it with a lot of money, and it didn't work out even then. I tried it with my own resources. I tried it when circumstances were good, and I thought I couldn't be touched. But guess what? Here came life. Here came life doing its thing. Here came the adversary shooting flaming arrows at me, trying to get me to quit, trying to get me to give up, trying to get me to throw in the towel. But all it did was reinforce my faith in him. All it did was remind me I'm doing something on this planet that he put me here to do, and he's doing something on the inside. Apostle Paul said it this way, you might be hard pressed, but you will not be crushed. How do you know that, Paul? Because my faith ain't in me. My faith ain't in what the doctor told me. My faith is not in my money. My faith is not in my popularity or status. My faith is not in the resources that I have or don't have. My faith is in the living God, the one who can do the exceedingly and abundantly above all. The one when life hits me, when it starts to toss me around and starts to knock me around and I want to quit, he says, remember, you put that faith in me. Let me go to work for you. I'm going to do this miracle for my name's sake. Not for your name's sake, but for my name's sake. Because there's people in your family that need to be saved. And this miracle I'm going to do through your life is going to bring them into the kingdom. Because it's the evidence they've been waiting for. The thing you need, you've been believing God for. Why don't you put it in my hands? I know you've been sowing. I know you've been giving. I know you're frustrated. But don't you take out that mustard seed and go putting it in other stuff. Those other things will fail you. It won't survive the heat. It won't survive the pressure. That's one thing about plastic. It melts when the heat gets turned up. That's one thing about styrofoam. It does not have the durability. I don't need styrofoam faith when I'm being sifted as wheat. I don't need plastic faith when the heat gets turned up. I need the kind of faith that is reinforced by the knowledge 
by the confidence and by the resources that an all-sufficient God has for me. For he is the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It hasn't left the earth. It just hadn't made its way to my hands yet. So what I'm going to do is be faithful what's in my hands and wait for him to send it to my hands because he knows the time in which he should do a thing. Anybody got a resilient faith today that I'll say, I'm going to keep standing. I'm going to keep putting my trust in God because I know he is faithful. I know he will come through. I've seen him do it in families. I've seen it do it in people. I've seen him do it in churches. When a time of need was necessary, we put our faith in him and the doors bust wide open with the presence of God. We might not have enough. It might look like I'm depleted. It might look like you're down for the count, but baby, you better knock on the thing that is supporting you because the quality of your faith is dependent upon the quality of what you put it in. Somebody shout, my faith is in God. Come on, my faith is in God for the miracle. My faith is in God for the healing. My faith is in God for a reversal. My God, my faith is in God. Come on, jump to your feet. My faith is in God. My faith is in God. You've been, you've been knocked around. You've been knocked around. Life is, as they say, life is life. And but I'm able to be sustained. Not only with the pressures of life can come, but the attacks of the enemy. Not because of what I can do. Come on, I'm... I'm living this thing with y'all. I'm preaching to myself right now. I'm preaching to myself. See, there's some things I'm believing God for that only He can do. Only He can do. And when Jesus said, have faith the size of a mustard seed, that father of that little boy, He had just healed before he did it, he said, if you can do it, Jesus. And Jesus said, if I can do it. He says, not about if I can do it. It's if you can believe. Can you believe that when you put that seed of faith in my hands and you work it and you trust it? See, this thing don't have the substance to produce fruit. It's not made of the right substance. This mustard seed, if I took it out and we went and planted it, it would begin to spring up. A seed always comes packaged with success already in it. It is the genetic makeup of every seed to produce. That is why Jesus likens our faith to a seed because it is expected to produce. Because the quality of your faith is dependent upon the quality of what you put it in. And as Jesus asked the disciples on a boat one night, we ask you today, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Is it in, is it in the, the president you want to elect next year? Where is your faith? Is your faith in what Wall Street determines? Is bull market or a bear market? Where, where is it? I can tell you what faith look like, looks like because I've seen it. And I've seen what faith can produce. I've seen my parents be faithful and give their whole paycheck as an offering to God to say, God, we're going to put our, our we're going to give an offering to say, God, we trust you and we believe you're bringing our son back into the kingdom of God. Now, mind you, this didn't happen for years later. It didn't happen for years later. As a matter of fact, I'm sure when they gave that offering, he was out there doing something he wasn't supposed to do. But faith looks crazy to people who don't have it in the right thing. Stop taking opinions from people 
who not only don't have the right substance, they're not even putting it in the right place. I can try to crush this thing all day long. I can do whatever I can. And in fact, um, our youth group might be mad at me because when I hit it, I cracked the table. God has given me all kinds of illustrations with this thing. Isn't that an illustration right there? That even when life hits you, everything can be cracked all around you, but I got this. I'm carrying my faith with me. And some people, I believe the Lord is wanting to do some things in, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get your faith in the right place. Have faith in God. And whatever you ask, you shall have these things. Now listen to me. Don't take what I said and go and be you know, irresponsible with what I'm saying. It's always according to His will. It's according to His will. It's what, that's, that's what look, putting your faith in Him looks like. It's, it's, I'm trusting you with this. It's not my will, but your will be done. Whatever your will is, that's what, that's what I'm going to put my faith in. And God is so faithful. There are times He doesn't give you what you want. You know why? Because God is good. He is good. So when He gives me the thing I'm believing for, He's good. And when He don't give me, and do you know why? He must have known something about the thing I wanted him to give me. And by him not giving it to me, it still says he's good. Because which of you, if your son asked for bread, would give him a stone? And ask for a fish and you'd give him a serpent or a scorpion. A good father knows what to give and what not to give to his children. And that's where your trust has to come in. Amen. If you enjoyed this message, why don't you go ahead and share it with someone, a friend or a family member, and follow us on social media at Hope Church WR. And we'd love to see you on a Sunday morning right here at Hope Church. Thanks for watching.